Shalom. Today we're going to look at another difference of translation that occurs between the Jewish translations and the Christian translations of Psalm 22:16. In the King James we read, For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. In the Hebrew, the word under contention is this word in pink, ka'ari. In all these Jewish translations, we see that it talks about a lion, and there is no mention of piercing. Where does this lion come from? One of the words for lion in Hebrew is ari. There are different names for the female lion and the great lion and the young lion. Ari is one of them. Numbers 24, 9. He couched, he lay down as a lion, and as a great lion who shall stir him up. Blessed is he that blesses you, and cursed is he that curses you. From 1 Samuel 17:36, Your servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. So this is the Ari, this is the lion, but what about the Kaf that comes before it? There is a full word in Hebrew that means to be like something or to be similar to something, and that word is kamo. We find it in Exodus 15:5. The depths have covered them, they sink into the bottom as a stone. Talking about Pharaoh and his chariots, like a stone, kamo, they sink. But there is a one letter abbreviation for this preposition, and uh, it talks about it in Brown Driver Briggs, an equivalent for k, before suffixes, always before light ones, occasionally before heavy ones. We don't need to know those rules, we're just looking at the cough. And there's another video about this, uh, I'll put a link to that. So, for example, in Deuteronomy 17 14, we see this. The full verse, when you come into the land which Jehovah your God gives you and shall possess it and shall dwell therein and shall say, I will set a king over me like as all the nations that are about me. The kaf is like, similar to, and the goyim, you know, are the nations. So together this ka'ari, which appears in Psalm 22, appears in some other places exactly in that form. Numbers 23, 24. Behold, the people shall rise up as a great lion and lift up himself as a young lion. He shall not lie down until he eat of the prey and drink the blood of the slain. In Isaiah 38, 13, I reckon till morning that as a lion, so will he break all my bones from day even to night, Will you make an end of me? And the Jewish commentators, when they're talking about Psalm 22, they always make reference to this Isaiah 38, 13, which is always translated as, as like a lion, similar to a lion. So where does the piercing come from? There is a verb in Hebrew, which is kara kufresh he. If you know any Hebrew grammar, you can see that ka'ari is not a verb that's ending in a third person past tense vowel. It should be u. There is no verb root, kaf, aleph, resh. Now, if there was a scribal error made and somebody had written a vav, instead of the yud, we sort of have this mixed thing come up, ka'aru, and maybe that's a bad spelling for karu. And so that's what we're looking at. An example of the verb kara, karu, in past tense, they dug. Genesis 26, 25. And he built an altar there and called upon the name of Jehovah and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants digged a well. And that would be karu, no aleph. So in several of these translations, we find a footnote referring to this possible scribal error. The Dead Sea Scrolls and some manuscripts of the Masoretic text, the Septuagint and the Syriac, carry the meaning they pierced. Most manuscripts of the Masoretic text are the Lion translation. It is said that there is such a scribal error in one of the scrolls of the Masoretic text that it actually says Kuf Aleph Resh Vav Ka'aru, and trans so it's translated, they dug, but I have not actually seen that text. I have only read about it. So when we come to the Septuagint, here is the verb 
oraxon, which appears in the New Testament, and it means to dig. Matthew 31, 33. Here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. So here comes the verb to dig. This is Septuagint, maybe first or second century BCE. When it comes to the Vulgate, the Latin translation, there are two different renderings. One supposedly based on the Hebrew text, he uses the word for bound. He bound, my hands and feet are bound. And this may have something to do with the fact that people didn't know whether in crucifixion hands were simply nailed or they were nailed and also tied. And then there's another rendering which follows the Septuagint for the word dig. So going back in time to the Wycliffe in 1382, we see there is a lion there. In the Luther, he uses the verb durchgraben, which means to dig. Coverdale begins to use the word pierced. And also the Geneva Bible, 1599. The Dewey Rames is a Catholic Bible that follows very closely to the Vulgate. They use the verb dig. King James is pierced. Webster is pierced. Young's Literal is pierced. The New Living Translation is pierced. The Net Bible includes the lion and another verb, they pin my hands and feet. The Message Bible follows that. They pin me down hand and foot. And the Passion Translation uses the word pierced. It also provides the footnote about the Septuagint and some Dead Sea Scrolls. There are words for pierce in Hebrew. The most common one that you might be familiar with is Dakar. It appears in Numbers 25, 8. And he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel, the incident of Finchas. And the most common place we see this, we recognize this verb, is in Zechariah 12:10. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, whom they have thrust through, and they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn son. Another common word for pierce in Hebrew is nakav, the idea of making a hole. Isaiah 36.6 Lo, you trust in the staff of this broken reed. On Egypt, whereon if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, to all that trust in him. Nakav is also translated several times as to express oneself in a negative manner or to curse, as we see in Numbers 23:25. And Balak said to Balaam, neither curse them at all, nor bless them at all. In many roots, the idea of cursing has to do with making light of something or putting a hole in it. Regardless of the translation, we do know that Yeshua did go to the cross, that he did receive wounds in his hands and feet as a result of the nails. When he says out from the cross, Eli, Eli, lama savachtani, Eli, Eli, lama azavtani in Hebrew, why have you forsaken me? He is not making a statement about the fact that God is turning away his face from him. He is making the statement that says, y'all go look at this Psalm 22. Look at the prophecy that was made a thousand years before this day, that God gave David a revelation through time that this would happen to me. Until next time, Tasimita inayim al keep your eye on the sky, your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom.